All right. Hi, Mr. Nick. I think Mr. Glenn has a little bit of an issue on his video. Uh, and I think he's back. Okay, so let's add him. Hi, Mr. Glenn. Nick, how are you guys today? Good, good. Doing well. Nice to meet you, Blaine. Nice to see you again, Snap. Nice to meet you, Nick. All right. Awesome. First of all, thank you guys so much for joining us here today at the Global Game Changer Summit. Um, we've been having a lot of audiences coming in for different segments. We have different people in different interests. And um, we're now in our entertainment track. And uh, this is where we wanted to get the two of you on screen uh, to talk a little bit more about the film and TV industry, about your um, contributions to it, how you guys started and so on as well. Uh, but before that, I'm going to start off with the most um, I won't say the most cliche question, but it's also a question that I personally think I would ask anybody that I meet. What are your favorite movies slash TV shows? One or two of them. Before, before we get into the other questions. Uh, I, you know, I, uh, I just had a kid a year ago, so I haven't been watching a lot. I've been, uh, you know, uh, I've been, you know, when he was first born, I was watching a lot like late at night, uh, for all mankind, that TV show I got into, I like it. I'm a little bit of a space buff. I wanted to go to Mars when I was a kid, maybe not with Elon Musk now, but, um, I, I, I like that show and, um, uh, that's the last one I can remember like really loving. What about you, Nick? I just found out a friend of mine writes on For All Mankind, and I got what? so excited because <laughs> I love that show also. Um, it's so good. It on it. He, and he did it like, I'm on a little show called For All Mankind. I was like, what? What <laughs> season four? And he uh, he wouldn't tell me. Ah, um, uh, that's too bad. Yeah, I think this is an incredible time for TV and film. So I always think about what's the most recent things that I've watched and loved. Um, I, uh, I I got super into Stranger Things season four. Okay. Uh, I had such a blast watching that. I have teenagers now, so watching things with them is a, a lot of fun. So when we all get into something, uh, when, as soon as we're done with this panel, I'm going to go see Black Panther Wakanda Forever. So uh, that's probably my next favorite film. Um, <laughs> and uh, I honestly, the, the the one movie that I think about all the time still uh is a small movie that came out like 10 or 15 years ago called letters from iwo jima which clint eastwood directed it's a black and white uh from the uh viewpoint of the japanese in world war ii and it is uh it's a beautiful movie from a guy who has uh had a real strange last 15 years yeah <laughs> he's a really good filmmaker all right amazing it's a good way to start off our our, our panel today with regards to knowing is it but you know the kind of movies that interest you and the audiences who are watching you can comment in the comment section below as well what are your favorite uh, movies or tv shows or you know stories that inspired you so much in that sense and um move on a little bit into today's panel and um, so two of you come from two different uh, sides of, of of film and TV in that sense, you know, Nick, you're you're into late night late night uh, TV, and Blaine, you've been uh, you know producing, you've been directing, you're teaching right now, and so on as well. So it's very nice for us to sort of like understand what exactly happens in 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 the, um, both of these things as well. So I think we can start off with a question to Nick first, um, with regards to the late night industry as a whole. Um, I think when we had our pre-discussion, you were mentioning a little bit about how exactly um, you know late night slots are filled up and what exactly what exactly constitutes in like what exactly is a late night show? What are things that you look for uh, as a late night uh, you know producer and so on? Well, the thing that's nice about late night in general is that it's an incredibly malleable format. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different types of late night shows out there. Some of them. All of them have comedy as uh, the sort of main focus. Uh, okay. Some of them delve a little bit more into politics and trying to come at things from a different way than you might see in a news program or on online and uh, using comedy to help uh, instruct and inform. Um, sometimes it's just silly. Uh, the type of late night that I've always enjoyed the most is uh, got a little tinge of danger to it. And, uh, you know, danger on broadcast television only goes so much, but it's that idea that you don't really know the next thing that's coming. And so that's exciting. And I think um, it's also because it's on so much. Most of these shows are on four or five days a week or sometimes they're weeklies, but regardless, they're on year round most of the time. And the idea that there's both the familial 
familiar uh, where you're seeing the same people, you get to know them, you get to feel like you know them really well. And also you're finding something new every every week or uh, sometimes every day. There's a, something that you haven't seen before. And whether that's, uh, oh, I can't wait to see what comedy sketch they're gonna do, or I can't wait to see their take on this news event that happened. Both those things I think really uh, are really important to uh, successfully make. Awesome, amazing! You know, I, I, I've, I've seen a couple of shows that, that that you know you've been working on and so on as well. Um, and I think late night is something that everyone has, like everyone watches it to a certain extent. But um, now with different formats, yeah, now with 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 different formats coming in, a lot of it. I think a lot of my experience with late night is more on YouTube. As as things come out, you know, as as short snippets and so on as well. But it's also very nice to watch it there because um, you some people enjoy that that shorter formats, ten minutes, five minutes in that sense. But there is a whole chunk of people who love sitting down and actually you know, going through the whole show in that sense as well. So uh, yeah, so I think another question for Blaine. Um, you know, you've been. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how you guys started. Maybe we can we can start that out uh, with Blaine as well. You mentioned this a little bit in your in your, your speaker session earlier as well. But um, you know, like when or like how old were you when you first decided, hey, I want to make films? And what were the first few steps like? Oh, um, making films was something that I always kind of wanted to do. Um, so. I saved up my allowance. I got like, you know, five bucks a week or whatever. And I saved up for years and I bought a, uh, the first thing I bought was a, a video camera um, and uh, go out with my friends and we just shoot stuff as like 15 year old, 16 year old kids. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you learn stuff that and, and you bond and you have friendships that last a long time because you've done things together and you've worked on things together. Um, so for me, movies were like sleepover times and things that I could do with my friends that uh, that helped us understand each other and helped us become close. And uh, and then um, my, uh, my father figure um, always wanted to be a writer and he died when I was 20. And I was like, I'm gonna be an actor because I, uh, I um, look just a little funny and I thought I could like make that work. Um, and so I, 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 when he died, I got a box of um, his writing and I was like, I can't, I can't, uh, I, I, I don't, I want to write um, and I, I, I shouldn't um, be doing this acting thing. So I kind of um, started doing it for him, uh, getting into writing and um, then, you know, started doing it for me um and that worked out even better uh and yeah i, I mean i just started kind of filming things because i want i like watched a fight scene in a movie and i was like can we replicate that like, can we do that and um you know uh, no that was the answer but you know you learn <laughs> along the way okay yeah that, yeah that that makes that makes uh so much sense i think in the beginning when everyone like at like as as a film student and as a filmmaker, in the beginning you watch something and you're like, hey, we're going to do that exactly the way it's done. But then you realize, nope, you cannot do that. It takes a lot of practice yeah. and a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, but that's how you get better, right? By by copying at first and then being like, can I improve on this? You know, that's fun. Okay, okay. Well, that's and I had a similar situation when I was about 15 or 16 where uh, mm -hmm. I, I was uh, not able to get a car. So uh instead i got a, a camcorder and nice. uh, and it was one of those I'm, I'm definitely older than you snot and i'm probably older than you too blaine but uh it was one of the big ones with a vhs tape in it that you put in there okay. so it was <laughs> chunky and uh but i take it everywhere so we used to record like we'd play improv games with my family and we record that and then we'd make like video parodies we did one nice. yeah we just like have you ever seen those arizona iced tea cans and they're just massive yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> commercial parodies with Arizona Ice Tea. So <laughs> like into uh, figuring out how to make things that we like. That's okay, awesome. now, that, that, that makes me like so intrigued to ask me, ask this question of like, what were your first few films like, like uh, when you first started out? And, and, and how, how was that experience for you in that sense? You know? uh, for me, um, for me, uh, um, I made a, I, I wrote, uh, 
I was in like an acting program in high school and this guy was like, I want to write, direct and produce a movie. And I was like, I'll help out. I'll hold the camera or something. And then um, it slowly everything kept on falling onto me until I was the writer, director and producer of this horrible, <laughs> horrible movie um, that uh, that was about these teens that like were convinced the world was ending. And so they got their like shy friend to do everything that he didn't want to do uh, because they convinced him the world was ending. Um, and then he found out it wasn't ending and it ends in a dark, you know, mysterious way. Um, and it was, you know, it was, it was just uh, an excuse to hang out with friends. And we did, we didn't film it on my camcorder. We did use the big VHS one because it had a better lens. Um, uh, so, um, <laughs> Uh, and much good that did the movie, uh, you know, real high quality. Um, but it was, you know, it was, uh, it was exploratory. It was something, you know, you take yourself so seriously when you're a teen. And I was like in comedy. I'm like, I'm going to write this like serious movie. And I'm, it was basically the movie Sullivan's Travels. If you ever seen that, where uh, okay. someone who's really wanting to be in comedy is like, I need to do something serious with grit, you know. Um, and uh, and comedy is much nicer. It helps the world a little bit more, I think. Um, like what you do, Nick. I think um, you know helps everyone feel a little bit better about the news items of the week because it can be scary. And then when you put comedy to it, they're like, Oh yeah, no, I get some distance from that. I can enjoy that actually. So. Yeah, we try. Thanks. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it works. Um, yeah. uh, we, uh, I feel like the first thing I made um, was with uh, with a friend who was a much better filmmaker than me in college, and we did a we did a short film about uh, senior citizens who were going on a first date together, and the yeah. panic that they felt in the same way that you would if you were a teenager or a college student. And uh, it was pretty fun. It was hard to find uh, actors, um, especially like we tried. We eventually found people who uh, acted in like local community theater in our in the town that uh, my school was at Syracuse. And um, and then we were like, yeah, do you mind spending like hours and hours with us while we shoot this over and over <laughs> and over, like perfect shots? Um, and uh, neither of us went into filmmaking, but we're both. Um, but my my partner now uh, is like a multi Emmy winning uh, children's television writer. So she's uh, yeah. Like I, we picked we picked the right people that were really like sweet and uh, easy to work with. So it was a good experience. All right, that's amazing. So let's see how how far you guys have come from the first few films that you guys have made, and then moving forward into um, the other things that eventually went on to, you know, win awards or um, you know, many people started watching it and so on as well. So let's let's talk a little bit about that, like like uh, breaking into the film and, and, and TV industry. Um, like a lot of times, as students who first start off, we have no clue with regards to where do we start in the film and TV industry. I mean, of course. There's that whole thing where you just grab a camera and you find a few people and then you just start making something. But um, you know, as we progress on, what were the first few steps that both of you took in your career that eventually led to whatever you guys are doing right now? I'll let Nick answer this one. I, I've always been going first. Go for it. Uh, well, I um, I think it's so hard. I think it's so hard to break in. Um, yeah. I feel terrible for anyone starting out because they're all nervous. Their parents are nervous for them. Um, <laughs> it feels like uh, you're watching your friends and they're all going into careers in which they probably know six months before they graduate that they can yeah. go uh, into another program or get a doctorate or whatever, whatever the next level is uh, of learning. And, uh, and there's often security there. And I think, you have to be a little crazy and a little artistic in order to want to delve into our world. And, um, and I think ultimately you have to be willing to allow yourself the time to get that first job. It's okay. really hard to find out what it is. I think it's um, hopefully people have taken internships and had a chance to do that right now that we're, further away from the pandemic, it's probably a little bit easier to get those things and have some real world experience so that at least you can get to know what you like, uh, maybe see 
worlds or types of jobs you didn't even know existed so that you can have like a wider swath of uh, choices when you're out there. Um, and the, the thing I said, I think I said it even earlier in, in, um, uh, in, in the speech that I gave is um, you're going for your first job. You're not going for your only job or your last job. And so yes. it is just a constant learning experience. And I think that um, the more people reach out and build up a, uh, mm -hmm. a group of potential contacts, that's the only way you hear about things because no one's looking for like, I'm not starting a, <laughs> I'll be starting a new show in nine months and I'm not looking for anybody right mm -hmm. now who is a PA or an intern to start on that job. I will a month before the show starts. And so there is no, there's no long-term planning that way. That's so well right, said. Um, yeah, I mean, for, for, um, for me, Honestly, it was kind of like more of a personal journey than an outward journey. Like I, I felt like a, a an interloper for a long time. Like I was like, I know, if someone's gonna find out that I'm not meant to be here very soon, and they'll all point and they'll all laugh, and it's gonna be that kid from The Simpsons, like his laugh. And I and I. Um, and it took me a long time to get over that. Uh, I mean, too long, I think. Um, and uh, and to kind of take myself seriously. Um, like, I was like, oh, it would be nice if that happened, you know, um, but I wasn't doing the right things. I wasn't like meeting people and um, going out for my first job. Uh, I, was, I was going out for like, you know, things that, I mean, I wasn't going out at all because I was just too afraid. <laughs> um, and so, the uh even though i had made some stuff and even though i uh, it took like things happening with my friends like i was in a sketch troupe and my friend um was a child actor and he got a producing company on board and they were like yeah you can write for tv this way and i was like oh yeah like that's a thing that could actually happen and so it was like oh i there's actual steps to doing that so if i were to start out again i would be contacting people with the job that I want and going, how did you start? What did you wish you knew? Um, and the people like you could just, you could just email any, it's like everyone's on Twitter. I mean, for now, for now. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, yeah, no Twitter, no Mars. Um, it's just one guy just going around with a baseball bat to everything. Um, but, um, you know, you can, you can reach out to people and you can find people in the metaverse or whatever's next. And um, and so like do that, like see if they're there and you'll get like a 10% response rate. And because people came up the same way and you know, like we're here talking to you guys because we're, we were asked, you know, uh, it's, it's not, um, so anyway, so I, 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 would, I would reach out to people. I would get to know how they did it and um, and uh, and that would be my biggest piece of advice on breaking in, I'd say. Yeah. All right. Awesome. awesome. It's very nice to talk to you guys more about it and to see how you know all of this started in a way. Um, so I thought we can we can move on a little bit into um, one one very interesting aspect. So for me, so I've I've worked on a couple of documentaries, uh, and mainly one of the things that I one of the reasons why I started going into documentaries was because I also run a startup that works with kids uh, and teenagers in schools. And, you know, I had an opportunity to meet a lot of people from different backgrounds, from different parts of the country, um, rural kids, um, urban school kids and so on. And you sort of understand like what exactly kids in my area are going through and what kind of stories would be best for them. Uh, if we were to develop this into a documentary or a web series or so on as well. So one of the things that I want to ask you guys is um, like in terms of and, and like in terms of um, producing something or writing something, is it important to get to know uh, people and cultures and you know go on ground and, and meet people? And how important is that exactly for a filmmaker or someone in, in, in the film and TV industry? And would that help in your process of telling better stories? Um, yes, <laughs> yeah, it would help. Um, I think that, um, as a, uh, as a person who tells stories or as a person that needs to come up with ideas, like meeting as many different people as you can, like, 
you never know who you can help and you never know who can help you. But beyond that, it's like learning about different people, uh, learning what they've gone through, uh, learning about their cultures and the differences and similarities. And um, uh, uh, like, I, I trade a lot on like um, on the way I grew up. Like I grew up pretty poor, and um, and so I write a lot about that. And um, you can see that in Sleeping Giant and all that stuff. So like I I think that um, you know, like using who you are is really important. But then knowing um, how to bring in people that are so different from you into your stories. Um, I mean, we we tell stories because we want to connect. And we want to like make ourselves feel good, and we want to make others feel good. And um, you know, travel is one of the great um, uh, ways to break down barriers between um, people and cultures. Uh, uh, but I think stories are are the next way. And so, um, where if you want to break down those barriers, you have to understand what those barriers are, and you have to understand what's on the other side of those barriers. So, yeah, I I'd, I'd, I'd say not traveling in my 20s it really held me back as a writer and i wish i had traveled more um but talking to people from all different classes walks of life um you know creeds has helped me understand the world a little bit more and, and that's filtered into my writing yeah what about you nick yeah i think uh for comedy um specificity can be really important um, okay because everybody's really i think uh it's always really fun to watch people in situations that you haven't seen before uh, on screen regularly and see how uh, how they tackle sort of a universal topic. So it's happened kind of a lot recently on the comedy end, um, like show like Reservation Dogs, which mm -hmm. is on Hulu and it takes place in uh, you know part of America that comedy didn't really happen with uh, people who are uh, indigenous who never really get on screen. And it's like created all sorts of stars, future stars, current stars. Um, are you allowed to curse on this thing? Uh, and Probably not. But you. There's a show called Rap S H uh, ah. point T on HBO Max. And it's about aspiring rap stars in Miami, and it's written uh, and produced by uh, some of the people who made Insecure. And it is very specific in terms of what they do and what they're trying to do, uh, but it's also very funny. And uh, again, like a, a place that isn't normally seen in, in comedy. Uh, the movie Bros that just came out a couple of months ago, it's a similar idea. It's a romantic comedy, but uh there's a gay couple at the uh in the in the leads and i think almost the entire movie is uh was written by and produced by uh the lgbtq community and again for a mainstream uh film to have that uh and sh showcase that type of uh difference and for it to feel familiar also as a uh, really special and i think important and like you can you can incorporate that into late night too where whether it's individuals in the writer's room <clears throat> or in front of the camera the more different voices you have who come from different places uh the better and more well-rounded the comedy is awesome that's amazing it's 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 it's, it's um i like, I like what, what you say Brian, about you know traveling uh, as much as you can and learning more and understanding more and and that's what you know brings um like like it, it gives you the, the the weight to your writing it, it makes it better you you understand what you're actually doing in that sense uh so yeah that's that's pretty pretty amazing so i have another question for nick uh, this is a very fun question uh so when it comes to comedy like how do you know what what works actually uh, as 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 <laughs> You know, it's a very subjective question, but I have this question on my mind all the time. Whenever I watch any show, like if whether it's sitcom like Modern Family or or the late night show, whatever it is, how do you know what works? In terms of uh, well, we like to say in late night, like it's a volume business, so not everything's gonna work, but uh, <laughs> you have a lot of opportunities to try, and uh, and the ones that um, you like, 
you hope other people like as well. Um, and so for us, you can't really get too in your head about it. You have to trust the group of people who you've entrusted with creating the uh, the comedy and, and putting it out there. Um, <clears throat> you know, we have the benefit of uh, a bit of time to edit, so we're not live on these shows. Um, so you're seeing, shockingly, sometimes the best of uh, what, what we have to offer. Um, and, you know, I'm not a big um, focus group person. Um, okay, I, yeah. I, it's not, I think that um, the best thing that a focus group can offer is if you, as a creative person, feels a certain way or on the fence about something, it might help to shape that idea, but it shouldn't dictate the idea. Um, and so occasionally that's helpful. And that might be something, you know, specific, like we love this bit. We'd like to see more of that bit. Um, okay. Or it might be uh, why is X so long? And you're like, yeah, it did feel kind of long. Uh, maybe we, maybe that shouldn't be uh, so long. Um, outside of that, you know, um, it's once again, like the more people that you have from different walks of life that work for you and, uh, you know, um, might watch a rehearsal or, or uh, a monologue or um, uh, or seeing an audition and uh, and they all feel a certain way. Um, if every if if multiple people like something and they're not all the same people, then you think, all right, well, we're in broadcast. Like, let's give it a chance there. Um, and then the nice thing about last thing I'll say about it. The nice thing about this time we're in right now is if you have conviction and you think something's funny, you put it out there and the world will tell you if they like it or not, if they see it. Um, and sometimes they don't, you just keep making it and you get better as you do it. So uh, there, there's no perfect answer. There's no right answer to it, but there's a lot of ways to sort of find out like, Oh, I think this thing I'm making is pretty funny and I think people will like it. Awesome, awesome. That's 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 pretty pretty uh, amazing to to you know just get an insight as to what that, what that would be like. So, but I like what you mentioned. Just put it out there. Go ahead in that sense. Uh, so this is a question that I'm gonna ask you with regards to, and this is uh, you know just adding on to that as well. Um, I think like you would have also faced this in the beginning with regards to um, is what I put out good enough or is what I put out there like will people watch it in that sense? And I'm very sure like now you guys are doing amazing but when you guys first started off that that fear is always there how did you overcome that fear what 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 were the things that you had to tell yourself or what were the experiences that made you realize hey i'm just gonna keep doing this until it, it it works uh for me like i did comedy and sketch comedy um when sketch comedy on the internet was like a, a thing and like like you know people wanted to see that um uh, I mean, maybe they still do, but uh, I'm I'm not making it. Uh, but uh, the um, it, we would just make ourselves laugh, and if like we made ourselves laugh, then we're like, okay, let's put that out there. And honestly, like Nick's saying, like we I I we have horrible sketches, up, you know, um, uh, and uh, and they just don't work. And you kind of knew they weren't going to work, but you're like, maybe. Um, and so I think that there's like a little sensor in your head that you get rid of um, in order to create. You're like, hey, you're not helpful right now while I'm writing or acting or, you know, doing those things um, that ask a lot of creativity for you. But I mean, when you're doing something that doesn't work, that like that voice will come up um, and it's just kind of to be in conversation with that voice and to be like, you have to be quiet now or like asking it questions when you need to learn from it. Like, I think we all kind of know when something doesn't work or falls flat uh, in for certain things. Um, for the drama side of things, it was like, I don't know whether anyone will like what I'm making. Um, and it, it took like actually putting it in front of people to be like, oh, like they get it or they don't. Um, I've done I've done plays too, and and uh, you know you you leave the theater, and the people are all there milling about, like leaving the theater, and so you'll hear them talking. You're in makeup or whatever, so they don't know who you are, 
um, and they'll, uh, they don't know that you're the writer, they don't know that you're the director, and they'll be so honest. So that really helped too, to, to like see a couple uh, that had come to the theater and the guy just absolutely hate it and be like, that was the worst piece of trash I've ever seen. And then the, the his, his wife or whatever being like, no, you don't understand it. It was like this. And like for explaining, <laughs> like, and like being like, okay, I'm a little spark in there I'm, or a wedge in their marriage. You know, like I get to be <laughs> that and that's, and that's like really that, but that's something right. And that, and that is instructive. And, and so I don't think, you know, until you put it out there on a certain degree. And then in the back of your head, that, that voice will be like, see, I told you not to put that out. And you're like, okay, I'll learn more from you as we go along. But it's kind of like you learn about each other, that voice and you, you learn and you, develop a relationship what blaine didn't tell you is that couple got divorced shortly later so <laughs> real sad real sad moments yeah but. they were my parents and uh no no, no. Uh, <laughs> i i um i think a little bit of fear is good uh when it's mm -hmm. come to um trying comedy and and it is a uh, like so many of these things there's a bit of that ten thousand hours situation where no one is going to be great at it right away or very few people are great at it right away but the more yeah. you do it the more you figure out uh what it is you like doing the most what it is you're best at um there are times where uh you know we'll do something to silence and we'll be like well that didn't work but we got to put it out anyway so maybe the internet will like it more than our audience did um and i've been on shows uh very specifically, we had to do a comedy show once in uh, the same studio where they do the morning news with the same crew that does the morning news. So there was no audience. It was just comedians uh, on a Friday. So they think of an entire week where everyone just wants to go home, but they're stuck doing this arguably incredibly stupid comedy show uh, with a bunch of guys who um, just have no, they just didn't care about the, the, the group. And and the only way to get through it was to lean into this idea that everybody in the studio resents us right now and doesn't like us. And we're not going to pretend otherwise. We're not going to pretend this isn't an incredibly weird space. And uh, and this episode of television we did turned out to be like a cult classic now uh, in the late night genre uh, <laughs> that people still talk about every year. And someone made a oral history of this one episode of TV five years after uh, we put it out there, because <laughs> it was like a. The, I think the headline was "What is this show?" Because <laughs> wait, what show was it, Nick? Which... It was uh, before Corden started. We had a bunch of these um, guest-hosted episodes of the Late Late Show, and this one week we were in New York, uh, and we had different hosts. And the final night was uh, Adam Pally and Ben Schwartz hosted the show. It's not okay. really online. Sometimes someone will put out uh, and like the 45 minutes and it always gets taken down for some reason. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so it just sort of exists in people's minds. Uh, it seems <laughs> like so it's grown. <laughs> it's grown this uh, following. Uh, so the people who so saw funny. it really enjoyed it. Um, and it was really fun to make, but it was because we just were like, well, we got to fill an hour. So let's just be as insane as possible. And and isn't it like, I don't know about you, but sometimes with the silence, I find that very funny in and of itself. Like I was oh, yeah. like, but that that works. Like you're not laughing, you have no soul. Like I don't know. There's like something in there where I find it very funny. Where you give a big joke and this cameraman's just like, you know, like there's a lot of that. there. Yeah. There were moments. I mean, not to talk too much about this one episode of television, but uh, but they, there would be a pause. And then uh, Adam, the host, would be like, I just heard the cameraman audibly sigh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just these moments kept happening. That's great. Um, it was really fun. I had to want, yeah, there was a, it's a, it's one of those things you, it's very hard to recreate that specific moment. But, um, but even like during the pandemic uh, with James, you know, we didn't have an audience. And so, uh, so it was just the people who worked for Corden who were, sitting very spaced out in our studio. And uh, he wasn't gonna go and like pretend to do a big monologue at the star that he normally would be at. So he just sat at his desk and started talking to all of us who were in there. And then the viewers of the show started to know all the people who are writers and 
camera ops and audio people and like they would call us out by name and like recognize us in the street sometimes it was like a surreal experience but you know we had trouble like all we saw were people like this on screen so um so like there was a bit of a craving for just communication and real world experience so we we i think did a little bit of that that's amazing. That's so amazing to see how you know the show. And I, and I like what you mentioned that sometimes it's it's the 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 unexpected things, the things that you would probably not find funny, which ends up becoming funny. And and um, I I know it, it's very nice to see that 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 it's not just me who's like holding my phone and doing it. And and it's also the same thing that's happening in a major studio somewhere as well. You know, it's it's it's, it's these small small moments that um, end up making something amazing. So yeah. So yeah, I. Saw, I and Oh, sorry. Just to jump on it because it's this is a fun t thing to talk about. Uh, did you all watch House of the Dragon by any chance? Oh, like started it but fell off it? the wagon. Okay. Yeah, yeah I haven't watched it yet. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. There's this one moment on the show, which is like I don't know. They must spend fifteen million dollars an episode on that show. Like it's a massive, massive show. But uh, during a rehearsal, um, a crown fell off of the king, and someone went to pick it up and put it back on his head. And they were like, oh my God, that's amazing. Let's put that in the show. That just happened in a rehearsal. It's like, the, <laughs> like we talk about it as found comedy, but it's like, I think found drama also. I'm sure you guys experience, or you play, I'm sure, and you not like experience, like, oh, this thing happened. Let's use that. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, mistakes are mistakes if you don't take advantage of them, I think. Um, and so, like, you know, it, 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 roll with it. I mean, I, I did improv for a long, long while. And, um, that's always the thing. Like you just, someone says something completely stupid to total silence and you, you have, you roll with it and it's, it becomes something so much more than it could have been, uh, originally. So, yeah. That's amazing. Oh, and sorry. And, and to speak, to go back, I, I wanted to say something about the James sitting behind the desk and, and talking to people. Like, I think that's the specificity, Nick, that you were talking about, uh, 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 as well. Like the, like if you in order to know if it works if you know someone that will love it like do it like put it to them you know um mm -hmm. like i'm when i write i don't write for like uh, or make a, a a production like i'm not like doing it for a hundred thousand people though i hope a hundred thousand people see it i i'm i'm doing it for like the one friend that I want to make laugh or like my wife uh, that I want to console or like what, whatever, right? Like I'm doing it for a reason um, for one specific person. And I think that type of specificity uh, not only works in comedy, but really works in drama as well. Awesome. Awesome. I, I, I like how this conversation is just like, it's also looking into the two of you as people and the way you guys see the world and the way you guys see things, because I think that matters a lot as a storyteller, um, you know, and, and whatever project you work on, it's bringing um, your own quirks, your own comedy, your own drama, your own stories that 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 you think people will enjoy. I think that's 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 pretty amazing as well. So we have one question from the audience, and. Um, Let's just take this question as well. So this question is from Ma. When do you guys generate ideas for your films or shows? Because keeping audience engaged for a long time is very hard. Uh, how do you, and that, that's, it's very interesting. Like how do you guys come up with ideas for uh, for shows or for for, for, for movies in general? Um, where does that come? Yeah, this is yeah. like, this is that question that uh, the, that everyone the kind of like uh, it's like what, why do I have to answer this question? Um, I think I think it's just hard. To, it's hard to answer though, right? Like I think that's yeah, why yeah. creatives are like, why do I have to? Because it's so hard to to answer. Um, uh, like I think for me, like I used to do this thing where I'd come up with ten ideas a day, um, and you'd run through all the ideas that have been percolating in one day. And then the second day you had to come up with 10 more. And I did that for a month. And like around day 29, I'd come up with an idea that I would never would have come up with otherwise. Like there'd just be fumes. I'd just be running on fumes. And sometimes that idea really worked and sometimes it didn't. But um, I think just trying to generate it, like even like, I think I'm frozen, sorry. Um, but even, even like if I, I, I would just put down like, seven different locations and then see what might happen that location like it really doesn't matter where it comes from it matters what you do with it um everyone okay. has everyone has similar ideas 
it's how you read it. It's your experience that you bring to it that matters. And so a lot of students come to me and they're like, how do I protect my work? I'm like, by making it personal and by uh, filtering it through your experience um, because no one can take that from you. But everyone, like, I mean, there, there was ants in a bug's life. There's like, you know, there's <laughs> movies, there's so many similar ideas out there uh, that come out at the same time. Like it's about making it yours and 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 putting it to your experience, um, but yeah, I'm interested in how you're going to answer this, Nick, because you <laughs> you do have to like keep people engaged for such a long time. Yeah. Well, also you have a one year old, so you're going to be watching lots of ants and bugs' lives and lots of <laughs> very soon, very soon. Um, I, you know, I think we have the benefit on the type of show that I do because it is, uh, you know, at least four nights a week often. Um, we are reacting to the day's news a lot of times. So the things that we are creating are coming from the uh, real world. And so it's that combination of like, people might not know the story as specifically as you do, but they might know the people and you have to come up with either uh, jokes that relate to uh, whatever happened or try to come up with, oh, well, like we can parody that thing. So like, the night of the um, uh, the night of the Oscars last year, with uh, you know the Will Smith slap, which you know was the only thing that everybody was talking about for the next week, and still you know talk about quite a lot now. Um, the uh, this wasn't me; I didn't come up with this, but um, but the the Late Late Show decided, oh well, let's do what we do really well are song parodies. So uh, so let's the, you know the big song at that point was we don't talk about Bruno. So someone came up with, well, what about, we don't talk about Jada. And so they wrote that in a day and shot it that day and aired it that day, you know, the, literally the Monday after the Oscars. And so like, it's also the beauty of, let's not think about it too much. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. Let's put it out there. We've got this professional crew. We get to make this. Um, that's again, like the benefit of, of us. And then sort of separately, some of the things that I do is like, once again, it gets to specificity. Um, where we're always looking for sort of recurring comedy things that we can do on a regular basis and we can have a set and we can, um, you know, when we need uh, something to fill the time that we all enjoy, we can do this thing again. Um, on a previous show uh, I did with Pete Holmes, um, he, uh, he is a podcaster um, before he got his late, uh, late night talk show. And he used to talk every once in a while on his podcast about weird thoughts he had at 3 a.m., 3 a.m. And and I was like, well, that, I think that's a bit like, why don't we take that and just write jokes about 3 a.m. thoughts and we'll put you in a bed and we'll make it look like you're asleep. And then uh, we did that once. And then we started having guests come on and also have 3 a.m. thoughts. So they'd be sitting in bed together, you know, him and Ray Romano or him and Patton Oswalt. And they'd each just be doing uh, esoteric one liners. And it was just a, like it was a joke box. But um, but these things can come from anywhere. And it's sort of like the beauty of having a dozen writers in a room if you could afford a dozen writers is uh you're just going to keep throwing things out there and someone's gonna be like yeah let's do that all right amazing guys um thank you so much for this conversation we're actually nearing the end of, of our panel session already and um, i learned so much from just having a conversation with the two of you and you guys are really fun to talk to um and thank you for you know giving your insights with regards to your industry. But just to end it off, I just thought of asking you this very last question. If there is one thing you think audiences sh should take away from this or from your sharing, what would that be? Like just one small piece of advice that you'd like to give for film students and for general audiences who are watching this as well. I'll go um, first while you're thinking. Yeah, about please, it. please go first. Um, I think uh, when you look at the three of us from three different backgrounds, uh, talking this excitedly for almost an hour, I think if you have that, uh, that passion for this genre, you're never going to regret trying to do, uh, work in this, uh, in this business. And not everybody is going to, uh, enjoy it as much as we do, but I don't think you'll ever regret trying it. Awesome. Yeah, I like that, Nick. And I and I think to build off that, I think there's a lot of and I say this in my in my uh, whatever speech I gave too. like, there's a lot of people that go into this wholeheartedly and are like, this is the thing that I'm doing with my life. And I will have no backup plan. 
no university mom and dad and i uh, and i will like do this uh, only and um it might feel like a failure if you don't like it and you don't want to do it anymore and i and i think there are a lot of people that stick in this industry not liking it making it horrible for everyone else um because they're they're just they they're just like i don't want to be a failure when if you're following if you don't like it and you follow your happiness somewhere else that's such a success um and i uh, you know for me i like i love doing what i do but i love teaching and i think like i'm so thankful i found teaching um like it, it's i'm following my happiness into that route more and more because i i just find that i can actually like have that impact um you know and so uh personally so like yeah follow follow what makes you happy and um and then the other advice i'd give is just do it like just go out and do it and you have a cell phone and everyone says that uh, but you can make a cell phone look pretty good now or like a moment lens or whatever just go and shoot some stuff with your friends and and um uh, and you won't regret that either all right thank you thank you guys so much thank you Nikim, for joining us for this uh you know panel session on breaking into the film and tv industry we look forward to speaking to you guys again in in in, in, in um, other events that we have and um, on behalf of the eselex pen club and the organizers of this summit uh, i'd like to thank the both of you for spending your afternoon today and uh yeah see you guys again next time thanks a lot okay nice to meet you nick thank you so much take care bye guys